today as they had just sung that song, as the deer panteth for water, so my soul longs for you. That's the psalm that we're going to be working through today. Um, so first I just want to pray. I just want to pray it in, pray that I can be a mouthpiece and um, I can point to God alone and not to myself. So if you would please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and I just thank you for another gorgeous day. I thank you for a great weekend, a weekend that we could come together and remember um, those who have fought and died on behalf of our freedom. Um, and I just thank you for today that I would be your mouthpiece and nothing more. That I would not be someone looked upon, but you would be the source looked at. Everyone would look upward at you and not to any other source. And I pray that through this message you would work in the hearts of the people. Um, you would proclaim your word alone um, as you are the living God, the breathing God, where life is intertwined in who you are alone and not apart from who you are. So I pray over your word and I pray over um, the words that you give me to speak, um, that they will be your words alone, guided by the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Son and for the glory of your name alone. In your precious holy name, amen. As the deer panteth for water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, when I can go and go and meet with God. My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remembered as I pour my soul out, how I used to go with the multitudes, leading the processions to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throngs. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep, waterfalls, in the roars of them, and all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all, all the day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Have you ever reached a point of such distress, of such despair, where it is literally a weight to your bones, to who you are. It drags you down. It tires you out. It literally wipes you out. In verse 1, David makes this point to say, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. I can't help to think about amongst a desert land, Storms of animals searching for that one bit of oasis, that one bit of water to quench that thirst. And they do everything that they can to find it. And though it causes them such distress, this thirst, it literally wipes who they are. It drains them. It makes them tired. And it wipes their energy. They search for it. And David is painting this picture of a deer longing for water. And he uses the word soul, which in encompasses everything about who he is, not just a spiritual sense. It encompasses everything of who he is. And it is taking this distress and this agony is just taking him down. And he's communicating this. He's expressing his emotion. He's introspectively looking at himself. He's inwardly looking at himself. And he's communicating what he's feeling. And he goes on to say in verse 2, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That word thirst, have you ever been to a point where you're walking or you're at a park or you're somewhere where you just don't have water and you're really thirsty and it's almost like debilitating? It takes a physical toll. You almost feel incapacitated. You can barely even move. And you're just looking for water. That's all you want. You just want 
one source of water, even if it's a dirty lake, you're going to dip your face in it so you can just cool off. And you just can't find it, but you're thirsty. David's describing his situation as thirsty. It's a debilitating feeling. He's, he's literally quenched. He just can't, he can't find the source to unquench it. And the only source that can is God. And he just is crying out, God, my living God. And you see the intensity building because he goes from God to my living God, the living God. He's communicating that life is literally intertwined with who God is. Apart from God, there is no life. But with God, life abounds. That's life is with God, not apart from him. And he even goes on farther to say, when can I go and meet with God? He's in such a desperate spot. He's just crying out, God, I just want to be with you. That's it. I I just want to be with you. Nothing else. It's no practice that he's longing for. It's nothing but God. He's longing for God. But this distress continues on. This despair continues on. And I'm reminded of a very familiar story, The Pilgrim's Progress by Paul Bunyan. And the Christian is wandering on with his really good friend. And he gets to this land and he's just tired. He's weary. He's gone through so much despair and he just lays down. He's just tired. Him and his friend find a nice piece of land just to relax. And he wakes up and this giant is cowering over him and his friend. And the shadow, they can feel the weight of it. And this giant's name is Despair. And this giant, he takes his friend and he takes Christian and he takes them back to his castle. And the castle's called Doubt. The castle of Doubt. And he takes him because you have spent time in my land. I need to take you here. You're weary, you're weak, and you've come to my land to rest? No, there's going to be no rest. So he takes him back to his castle, the castle of doubt, and he puts him in the dungeons. And first he takes this physical toll on him. He beats him. He beats Christian and his friend. And they're in this jail cell, and they're just distraught. And Christian doesn't know what to do. He just wants to give up. He just wants to let everything go and just say, I'm done. I'm done with this. But his friend comes alongside of him and encourages him to move on. And how often God and life are much more real in these desperate circumstances in which we all face or we all will face. The answer of what sums up life is most pertinent to the questions fired outwardly and asked introspectively. Are we going to answer those questions by saying life is with God? Or are we going to give over to the despair and to the questions of doubt that rise as Christian is locked in this dungeon thinking about giving over to? But his friend that was there who encouraged him, his name was Hope. He pushed him on. He said, don't give up. Don't give in, but continue on. He helped him to reflect what Christian was communicating His best friend, Hope, helped him to take what he was communicating and reflect on what he was actually portraying by his emotions. And hope is such a big word. And I think about the sun. We go to bed not thinking about it, but hope that the sun will rise is not simply a feeling. It is, despite your feelings, it is just confidence. You don't think about it. That hope is just so secure that the sun's just going to rise. But the hope or sure confidence that we have in God is 10,000-fold to that sun. We can be 10,000 times more sure that God is going to be faithful, that God's hope, our hope in God, is going to carry through. It is a reality and an actuality that it will happen that the things he has said will come to fruition. Just look to the cross. Look to Christ. Look to the resurrection. Look what he did and look what he has done in our lives. We are here because of that cross. And some of you don't know that cross. And I just hope and wish that you would look to that cross, that you would stare to Christ and you would be enamored and consumed by Christ. 
his death, his resurrection, his promises that we know are secured through the resurrection. And that hope, that is the hope that we have. And that is the hope that Christian's best friend, Hope, was encouraging him in and pushing him forward to in. Romans 5, 3 through 5 talks about this, that I don't, we, we can have surety in our sufferings because sufferings bring perseverance and perseverance approved character and approved character, hope. But hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. But so many times this despair leads to shame. It leads to guilt. And I think about the life of Job, his friends. They said, this is your fault, his despair. But that's not true. We, we, we look to Psalms verse 4, um, chapter 42. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitudes, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throngs. It's a very transitional point in the psalm. Because up until this point, he's just pouring his emotions out. He's literally pouring himself out, he says. That intensity, with such intensity. And we go back, and all the day long, he's just thinking about this question, where is your God? All the day long. His enemies keep firing this at him. And you just think for a moment that as he's pondering this question that his enemies have asked him, where is your God? Where is my God? Do you think for a moment doubt could have crept in and that could have been his next reaction? But how he follows that is he calls himself to remember everything that it took within him. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitudes leading the processions to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throngs. And those festive throngs, Passover, first fruits, the tabernacles, they were all a reminder of God's faithfulness. And they were all a reminder of God's continual future faithfulness that would come in the form of a Messiah who would save those who believed. And he cries out in remembrance. He's calling his soul, his mind, to remember. Remember these things. So we see this process of he communicates. He communicates his emotions. He's not afraid to do that. And I think a lot of the times we get really scared to communicate how we're feeling. We think we're going to be looked down upon because of it. But if one thing is true of all of us, we all have emotions and we all have feelings. It's true of every single one of us in here. And we need to communicate them. We need to be able to feel free in this community to communicate them. And David calls back to remembrance. What is he remembering? He's remembering the community, the communal aspect of praise, the communal aspect of joy, that worship. He longs for it, and he remembers it because in remembering it, he's knowing that sometimes to remember the past helps set the future and the present hope in a reality. Because we are only feeble human beings that forget. And you see that hope, the friend of the Christian, you see in his discourses, remember the Lord. Remember the past victories. And remember the past endurance that he kept you on. Remember. And I'm reminded of a very strong passage in Corinthians, where Paul cries out, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I declare to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the th third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. I want to hyphen the word, now I would remind you, brothers, 
we as human beings, we're forgetful. And a lot of the times, it is an unintentional omission. It's just something that we struggle with in our mind, that our mind doesn't always remember everything. And sometimes we forget. But sometimes it's a purpose-filled omission or disregard because of circumstance, because of something you're going, going through. And I looked to Christian in The Pilgrim's Progress. His answer was, I just give up. But his friend who came along, Hope, said, no, you've got to keep going on. Look at what has happened. Remember. Remember what was faith, how God was faithful to you. Remember these things. Remember the gospel. Remember it. It will push you on. This hope is going to carry you through. And in verse 5, we see, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And one thing you see is he's preaching to himself. He's not preaching to himself inside the circumstance or inside the feeling, but outside of it. He's running to the scriptures that he knows. He's running to the God that he knows to preach to himself. To say, I am taking what I know, what I have seen you do, and I'm taking it to carry me through. Because that hope in my God who has been so faithful to me, who has taken me from where I started all the way to here and carried me through the whole time. That's the God I believe in. I don't believe in a God of my right now circumstance. He's not believing that this distress or this despair is going to determine who God is for him. His emotions, his emotions don't determine who God is. But he preaches to himself. And sometimes we forget to preach to ourselves. I mean, if I can be honest, there's multiple times where it's like, I get so used to preaching to others that it's like, wait, what about me? I need to hear this just as much as other people need to hear this. Because then I become forgetful. And I think it's always they need to hear it. They need to hear it. But what about, I need to hear it too. I need to preach to myself. I need to remind myself the gospel. Paul makes that clear. Remind, may I remind you. They had forgotten what is of first importance, the gospel. Let us not forget the gospel. It is our hope. It is our sure confidence that will carry us through. And then he goes on again. He says, my God, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. This reflection and this preaching breaks through the circumstance. It broke through it. Because he says, my soul is still downcast. It hasn't changed the circumstance. The circumstance is still there. It's still laid out the same way. It didn't change. His hope did not change the circumstance. And I don't want to fool you that hope is going to break through the distress and break through the despair immediately. But sometimes we need to look to the past to remind us of the present and the future. He's looking to the Jordan, which would be with the promised land. He's looking back and he's saying, I remember the land of the Jordan. I remember it. And he's reminding himself of that truth, that God is faithful. He serves a faithful God, forever faithful. And he keeps reminding himself. He keeps preaching to himself. He keeps pointing himself back to the faithfulness of God. He's he's not using his circumstance or emotion to determine that reality. He steps outside of that reality to look to who God is, not to what his circumstance is. Because it's not about what his circumstance is. It's about who God is in the midst of it, that he's with you. And then he moves on in verse 7. He says, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. If you look at this transition from when he started, it is a beautiful picture. Though he is looking in despair and he's saying, God, all I feel is judgment right now. I just feel like your waves are breaking over me. But you see in the beginning, he's thirsting. 
this thirst isn't being quenched. And he's just longing. But now you see he's in an abundance of water. Yes, he's being broken over by these waves. And yes, he feels the judgment of God upon him. He feels like he doesn't have any control. He's realizing he doesn't have any control. He doesn't. Over his situation, he doesn't have control. But one thing that this points to is that hope is simply not circumstantial. And he returns to this water metaphor to portray his fall. Despite his newfound hope, his desperation and circumstances have not changed. Hope does not change any circumstance. It carries us through them. It gives us purpose to continue on, to move forward despite. But also, his hope led him to not only see the judgment of God, but to be awakened at the immensity of him. Your waves and your breakers, your waterfalls are crashing over me. God, you're so immense. Deep cries out to deep. And he, he's just awakened at the reality of God, at this mighty reality. And I want to just reflect on it. Romans 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for eager longing to revealing of the Son of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For hope for what he, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And you see that all throughout this. David cries out to himself, hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It's not instantaneous. But his hope is carrying through him through this dire circumstance. It's carrying him through. And one thing you constantly see, he returns to communicating his emotions. I just, I feel like a lot of the times for so many people, emotions become something that is just so downplayed that we shouldn't communicate them. They're wrong to communicate. It's wrong to feel. But that's simply not true. It is simply not true. That is wrong. This psalm testifies to that. David, despite his hope, and in all of his hope, it's carrying him through, but he is still crying out in despair and in distress. He's still crying out with that emotion, with that intensity. He never stops crying out with that. It's not wrong to communicate your emotions. It's just not, it's not wrong. But we have been led to believe that it's something that is just innately wrong. That we were created with emotions and they're not a good thing. But if we were created in, in the image of God, our emotions are a good thing if they are utilized in the right way. And we're going to walk through that in this next part as we move on to what the hope did in David. In verse 8, he moves. He says, By day the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Hope proves worthy as he remembers who God is, was, and will always be. Hope led to the outpouring of practice, outpouring of prayer, outpouring of song, outpouring of the reality of the character of God, this perfect character, his steadfast love. He cries out and he says, I remember your steadfast love. Your song is with me all the day night. It carries on inside of me despite my circumstance because of the hope that you have set in me. You have revealed this hope to me. 
And then I, I think back to Hope's first discourse in the Pilgrim's Progress. He calls the Christian to remember the Lord. Remember who he is. Remember what he has spoken. Remember the Lord. Remember his character. Remember his faithfulness. And so many of us in here, we have such despair because we feel this weight of guilt, this weight of shame that is so pulling on who we are. But I want to say, hope in the cross. God is faithful. He has forgiven you despite that guilt. That guilt is not of God. The cross has forgiven that. That shame is not of God. The cross has forgiven you. You should. Don't feel that. Have hope in the cross. Just remember the cross. Remember why God has brought you here. Remember what he has done in your life. Tozer says this about who we are. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the more portentous fact about any man is not what he had any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Is your idea of God being defined by your emotional response to your circumstance? Or is your idea of God being defined outside of that? But what happens when there is this disconnect? Because sometimes our emotions, if we're honest with ourselves, being flawed human beings, lead a disconnect. And I remember so many times in my life where the circumstances were just not going how I wanted it to go. They were awful. And the sovereignty of God was just so hard to believe. Are you really in control? Is this really a situation where you know what's going on? And what took me from one side to the other was my hope. And it was something that I needed to remind myself that oftentimes I just didn't. I didn't look to the cross, and I didn't look to my hope. I didn't look to Christ, the risen Christ, who's living and seated on the throne. I didn't. I looked to my circumstance, and I looked into my emotions, and it ended up taking me so far to a place I didn't want to be. Emotional strain. Just tired, worn out, because I had nothing to hope in because my circumstances were defining it. But I say in this moment that disconnect, it's real and it will come. But what keeps us plugged into God is that hope, is to constantly remind ourselves of that hope, to remember who he is, what he has done, and what he is going to do, how faithful he has always been through our lives, carrying us through over and over again forgiving us the grace he has poured out upon us, the grace that constantly we need to remind ourselves of that we constantly forget. And then in verse 9 we see, I say to to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all the day long, where is your God? There is a full vision shift. His eyesight is being fixed from one thing to another in this point. You look in the first three verses how he communicates to these last three, and you just watch this shift. In the first, he communicates to himself. He's he's talking to himself. It's very introspective, inward self talking. And then he shifts from that to outward communication with God. All his questions are sopped and soaked in faith rather than the doubt in which they first started. He communicates in doubt. Where is your God in the beginning? And in the end, he says, to my God, my rock. He communicates that 
When he's talking to self, he's doubting. But when he starts talking to God, my God, my rock, his questions are being answered by his faith. And his faith are giving the answers of hope. And you see this, but emotions are still in the same place, but they're being communicated in such a beautiful, right way to God. He's communicating to his God. He reveals that upward is the communication, not inward. The communication should direct us upward to our hope, where our hope lies. And then it's it's communicated in such a hopeful, faithful way to my God, my rock, a foundation that will never be broken. And you see in the parable where Jesus shares with the sand and the, and the building the foundation upon the sand versus the rock. He says, my God, my rock, my steady boulder, you're not going anywhere. You're not moving. Your foundations are sure. Your faithfulness is steadfast and your love will carry on. My hope is secured in, your, in my confidence in you because you confidently set it there because you always carry through. And you see that he's asking these questions in such faith rather than doubt. And it's revealed it all goes back to his response and crying out to God, my rock. But his distress remains and it is communicated that way. You don't see his emotions changing and his situation surely doesn't. But what changes is what he is looking to for the answers. He's not simply looking inwardly anymore. He's looking up. He knows that everything that is happening, he still has hope. Despite how he's feeling, he still has hope. Despite the disconnects, he still has hope. And then he goes on in verse 11, or verse, actually verse 10. It says, my bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all the day long, where is your God? One thing you notice is the pain that he shows that words actually communicate. He's saying it's like a knife to my bones. It's cutting me. Words are like a weapon of deadly measure here. And he's revealing, they hurt. And you see another cry of despair that words were as painful as a knife, literally a weight to the bones. But what did he preach to himself? Because sometimes words can impact the way we think about ourselves. They can literally get inside of our mind and then we start taking these words and preaching them to ourselves. And we break ourselves down. And we take ourselves down just as our enemies want. But how does he shift? How does he take these words saying they're like a knife literally cutting me? They taunt me all the day long. I think about them. I see them. I taste them. Where is your God? But he runs back in verse 11. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Despite the circumstance and despite the emotional reactions they were causing, despite the wounds that felt deadly that these words were making upon David, he communicates hope. What carries me through all of this? How do I combat in this? How do I fight against this? I fight for hope. It was hope that was always fought for the Christian to continue on in the pilgrim's progress. It was that hope that was always fought for. And I'm just today feeling that some of you need to know that it is hope that you need to fight for despite your circumstance. Because that hope is a sure confidence beyond all things that you could even imagine. More sure than the sun will rise. And some of you are just putting your reality before God. You're putting your circumstance at the throngs of who God is. And all that despair 
is causing you to view God in a way that is just not true. And I just want to cause you to look to the hope. Let me remind you something that I need to remind myself of first importance. Christ died and was raised on the third day. And he appeared to many and he rose into the heavens that we may be forgiven, that we may be one day risen with him, that we may live with him eternally. We have that hope, a living hope, a perfect hope that goes beyond all measure, that is beyond all measure. And in your circumstance, remind yourself of that hope because that is the hope that we need to constantly preach to ourselves. It should be hope that we fight for, that Christians will continue on despite their circumstance. Let me just pray really quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and I thank you for this message. I thank you for allowing me to give it, um, allowing me to go into a word that I don't even deserve to go into, but you so graciously allow me to. I pray that this message would be on the hearts of many and would cut through to them as you work through your spirit. And I just come before you and thank you for everything that you are. And that despite our circumstance, our hope is sure. We are securely fastened to you. We are securely fastened by you. That we may run to the cross in our circumstance. That at the cross, our problems and our distress would beckon and fall to their knee. Because you are greater still. And remain greater. I thank you for everything you are. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for everything that you have given to us. All general and special revelation. That the sun rises and we know it is by your hand it is carried. And at the blossoming of a flower we know it is by you. It blooms. It has that ability. And I thank you. And I pray, precious holy name, amen. So in the spirit of remembrance, let us come together and fall before the face of who God is and his faithfulness in the cross and remember his sacrifice through communion that we would prepare ourselves and look at ourselves to remind us who God is and what that hope means to us. And that this would be a reminder to you today who God is.